just between you and me, I only became an author literally for the money and fame. That's it. Absolutely no other reason. Once I hit bestseller, I was like, that's it. My entire life is complete. There's absolutely nothing else, no other mission that I have to accomplish on this earth. I'm set for life. Obviously, this is an exaggeration, but seriously, when my book hit number one on Amazon, one of the first things people said to me was that, hey, wow, you can call yourself a bestseller now. So that was a really interesting kind of first impression that I had when it came to these bestseller lists. And of course, I've talked about them before. There's lots of different versions and kinds of them. There's different ways to achieve bestseller. But one question that I don't feel like many people answer is what happens after you reach bestseller? It's like Cinderella riding off into the sunset. What happens? Is there a happily ever after after the happily ever after? So that's exactly what this video is going to be talking about of what happens when you ride off into the bestseller sunset. So I'm going to be leaning on a few different people for their expertise and their opinions. And the first person that I'm going to be introducing is Tucker Max. He is the co-founder of Scribe and the author of not one, not two, certainly not three, but four New York Times number one bestsellers. So I, I don't really think there's anyone more qualified to talk about bestsellers than Tucker Max. And he wrote about this in a blog from a while ago in 2016 called How Bestseller Lists Actually Work. And what he says pretty much right off the bat is that every single list is either only measuring a limited number of sales in a few places or far worse, it's a curated list and a small group of people are deciding what to put on their lists. And I've heard that this is especially true of the New York Times bestseller list. For whatever reason, bestseller lists are not always absolutely true to the number of books that have been sold within the US or maybe even worldwide. Um, there's a database that we have called, it used to be called Nielsen Book Scan, but now I think it's called Stracana. I don't know why, I don't think it's as descriptive of as the previous name, but basically it tracks, I don't know, I wanna say like 70 or 80% of physical book sales within the US. And although they track most book sales, they don't track all book sales. This does not include eBooks. This does not include audiobooks. This does not include library books that are being checked out. This doesn't count books that have been gifted at author events or anything like that. This is just hard facts, shops, you know, local indie bookstores and chain bookstores reporting their facts and figures to Circana to collect. And although they are one of the biggest collectors of book sales and data, that isn't always represented on some of these bestseller lists like Wall Street Journal, even though they don't really do bestseller lists anymore, I don't think. Like the New York Times, like USA Today, like all those things, they don't necessarily pull their facts and figures directly from Circana, which is why Tucker Max says here that usually these bestseller lists are either, you know, measuring a very limited number of sales from a particular pool of figures or they're just curated. So each bestseller list, depending on what you're going for, is going to have their own needs, their own requirements, their own prerequisites. Again, I've spoken about this before in some of my past videos, especially around the New York Times, because that is one of the most notable bestseller lists. And a lot of um, people with weight behind their names, whether they be franchise authors or industry figures or celebrities or influencers, you know, it, it's not outrageous for them to want to hit, you know, one of the top slots on something like the New York Times. Although there is no like full on black and white listed strategy or, you know, check these boxes in order to get number one on, you know, the New York Times, nothing like that really exists because the Times has such a tight lid on sort of how things work on the back end. So a lot of it is just educated guessing. It's hard to say what works and what doesn't. I think it's more a matter of correlation rather than causation. Because I did these things, it increased my chances of hitting bestseller versus because I did these things, I got bestseller. Because really, truly, no one really knows how that stuff works. It's all just educated guessing and speculation, like I mentioned. Typically, you need to have some kind of major traditional book deal. Traditional book deal, in case you don't know, is pretty much what a lot of authors aspire for or aspire to. It's getting a contract to work with a notable press to publish your book. And the perk of this is that it's free. You don't have to worry about the production. Everything is sort of taken care of for you. It's very much like a done for you type of model versus self-publishing where you're kind of doing it all yourself. And a lot of people are one man bands. You get a lot of credibility, you get a lot of notoriety. Again, these are like names that you can leverage for your own platforms or any other opportunities that you wanna have. But the trade-off, probably one of the biggest trade-offs or two of the biggest, I should say, is that number one, when you sign that contract, generally speaking, you are signing over the rights to your book 
to that publisher. So you are kind of like the book's surrogate. Like you, you made it, you crafted it, you put it all together and you're handing it over to whatever publishing company that you're working with. And in exchange for doing that, you're gonna get a small chunk of the royalties, generally around 10 or 15%. If we're being modest, we'll say maybe 10% or so. So there's definitely not money in it. Again, just depends on how much you value it, what you're willing to do to get it. And when you have it, what are you gonna do about it? Generally, you also need to have at least 10,000 pre-order sales. Uh, and pre-orders is sort of like giving you the opportunity to start further ahead of the starting line compared to everyone else. So for a lot of these big bestseller lists, it's important that you have tens of thousands of pre-orders because when your book is on sale, you're already like, let's say 30,000 orders ahead of the curve, right? So it's just, you're, you're just kind of staying ahead of the game. You also need to have a lot of mainstream media attention, right? Like the Washington Post featured my book, the New York Times featured my book. Any of those major, you know, media outlets are really gonna kind of be like the cherry on top of this whole thing. And if you were to invest in something like a campaign to hit bestseller on the New York Times list, then some of these campaigns can range from about a good $50,000 to $200,000 plus. If you wanna buy your way onto the list, I don't know what the specifics of that are, but I've seen figures as high as a quarter of a million dollars. So this is definitely not cheap. Within Tucker Max's article, he says that almost all of the impact of hitting a bestseller list is personal and social impact. And I would say that I have to agree with this. Do you get loads of money and amazing brand deals or something from hitting bestseller? Usually no. Do you get gifted Rolex watches and majorly amazing PR boxes and maybe a Birkin bag if you're lucky? No. <laughs> a lot of it just has to do with status and credibility if you want the short answer. Um, and that's exactly what Tucker Max talks about. You can say that you're a bestseller, like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you can use any features that you've gotten as a result of hitting bestseller as social proof on your website, on any profiles that you have, if you do any kind of work or you know services or you do product, like any kind of service based service-based work, you can use that stuff as social proof or credibility. Bestsellers are often a sign of a book's quality and it's often used as leverage to get future opportunities as well, speaking probably being one of the most popular. Really the major benefits of, you know, getting on stage and doing speaking opportunities is brand expansion being probably one of the most popular. Again, it's more status and more credibility and more leverage that you can use. And of course, visibility. Anytime you see your name in big letters, whether it's featuring a guest speaker or featuring, you know, number one New York Times bestseller, you're, you're gonna have a lot of weight behind your name. And oftentimes that weight can convert into visibility, whether that be physical or virtual. And I think what people don't often think about is if you want it, and hypothetically you get it, what are you gonna do about it? And that's oftentimes why I say that with any influx of eyes and ears that you get on you, you wanna channel that towards something. And usually speaking opportunities is one of those big things because it, it's kind of a win-win all around. The venue gets a really amazing speaker, you get more visibility and creative opportunities, people hear your story and it's just like triple wins all around. So if you want like the short answer, those are some of the four most non-tangible immediate benefits of hitting bestseller. And it's ultimately up to you to determine how much value you're placing on outcomes like that. And if you think a large investment, whether time or financially or both is worth you know, those particular outcomes in terms of best case scenario. One other additional article that I did wanna bring in for some extra perspective is from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And although this article is older, it's from 2004, it's called The Surprising Impact of Bestseller Lists. And this is just kind of meant to validate everything that I've said so far. And basically at the end of the day, what this article says is that most sales occur soon after a book hits the shelves and sort of gradually peters out, which is what I've seen with my book. It's what I've seen with other people's books. It's just very normal for something like that to happen. I feel like sometimes you know, people have this misconception that if a book is out there, it's gonna keep selling. A book launch is meant to have an increase in sales and then it's just, it's gonna be sort of like a bell curve downward. It's very, very natural and okay for that sort of thing to happen, which is why on my channel, and especially in my most recent videos, I'm always talking about having something else beyond the book because when sales dry out, especially if it's years until you write your next one, assuming you wanna write another book, then you need to have something in the meantime to kind of keep people occupied and keep the waters warm. And this is often where your brand kicks in and you have all these like other like things and services and opportunities and things that you do in the meantime so that when you have another book to promote you know it's a little bit easier to to promote and you can just kind of continue building on that snowball so 
Not trying to go down that rabbit hole, but basically he says, most sales occur soon after a book hits the shelves and gradually peters out. If anything, what appearing on a bestseller list does doesn't so much cause your sales to increase from one week to the next, but rather to decrease at a slower rate, which I thought was a really interesting point. And I'm really glad that that's something that he highlighted in this article. So from 2001 until 2002, so this is like way back in the day, there was an assistant professor of strategic management at Stanford, and he found that, quote, 109 different books failed to make the Times list, even though Nielsen reported that they sold more copies than other titles on the Times list. And I think this is also a really good real world example of how bestseller lists aren't always representative of book sales and like true facts and figures. And the reason that I brought up, part of the reason why I brought up an article from so long ago is because it's to show that this is not a new thing. This is something that's easily been happening for the past 20 years. And it has been a thing that's been happening for the past 20 years, especially if someone from Stanford is saying so. These, these are smart people at Stanford. <laughs> and that actually, when and when I read this, it actually reminded me of um, another article or a feature or a blog or something from, I want to say like a year ago, where James Patterson actually complained about his book not being featured on the New York Times because he outsold a lot of these people who were featured on it. So this is like another real world example to kind of tack on to that quote here. I don't want you to think that I'm like making this stuff up. So I'm leaning on a lot of different perspectives and stories here. Or even that um, that really popular horror movie, I think it was like The Exorcism of Emily Rose or something like that. If I recall correctly, that movie was also based off a book. And usually if there's a movie adaptation of a book, the movie kind of helps boost book sales and bring more visibility and awareness to the book in general. The author of that book also complained that his book wasn't featured on the New York Times because he sold, I want to say like, millions of copies of his book, right? Because it was such a, it was such a huge hit, you know, that book sales just boomed and he wasn't featured on that New York Times list. And I think he even took it to court, if I recall, and ended up losing it because the New York Times, in order to defend themselves, had to openly admit that yes, we curate our titles. You know, it, we do not lean solely on facts and figures from Nielsen Bookscan or Sir Connor or whatever. So that's also another real life example. It's definitely not a fair game. The book industry in general is known for being extremely subjective and a lot of it I feel boils down to who you know and how well you know them, right? So what does this really mean? Like at the end of the day, what's like the big benefit? If I had to boil it down into one or two sentences, like what's the big benefit of being on the New York Times list? Again, I'm gonna be leaning on that article from Stanford because it said that previously bestselling authors got the least benefit from being on the New York Times list while unknowns had the greatest jump in sales, meaning that it's basically free advertising for new authors, which is kind of good to know like I'm glad that authors are getting like the bulk of the attention and the visibility and the prestige and the notoriety and all that stuff. Like I, I think that's a really, really great thing, especially for unknown debut authors. That's always really nice to see. But it seems that, you know, those who get the most benefit are usually the newer people or, you know, the newer debut authors. And when they get it, what do they get? They can say that they're a bestseller. They can use any features as social proof or social credibility. It's a sign of a book's quality and even maybe their author authorship quality, I don't know. And then leveraging those things to get new opportunities like speaking. And what comes with speaking? Brand expansion, more status and credibility, and even more visibility. At the end of the day, those are the major benefits that come of a bestseller list. That is what happens when you ride off into the sunset. You don't get the yacht. You don't get the million dollar check from Ed McMahon. You don't get any of those, or maybe you do. I don't know. I would say that that's maybe more of a rare instance if that does happen, but generally speaking, it's more non-tangible than it is tangible. So at the end of the day, knowing all of that, is it worth it? And that's a really phenomenal question to ask after, after all that's been said. I would say in my own words that it depends again on how much value you're placing on your book or on something like that. Or I would even say ultimately your brand because books often lead to brands. In the eyes of the industry, a book is only new for one year. That's really not that much time. That's like a drop in the ocean. So what are you going to do in the meantime? What are you going to do when you have it? What is this going to, what, what does this mean to you? Why do you want it? I think those are really great personal questions to ask if that is like, seriously a goal for you. I would say that it depends on how much value you're placing on the book. I would say that is worldwide credibility and status worth a $200,000 investment? And do you truly believe that you're going to make that back in one way or another, whether that be sales, whether that be speaking opportunities, whether that be X, Y, Z, and I'm going to save you some time for majority, the answer is probably going to be no. And again, if you got it, what would you do with it? If your answer is 
wait for the opportunities to come, I would highly recommend making a game plan. And again, that's something else that's gonna be another time and money investment. So these are really, really great, important questions to ask and seriously consider. Otherwise, if you're just here to learn a thing or two from your homegirl, Lauren, then there you go. That is what happens when you ride off into the bestseller sunset. <laughs> So anyway, I hope this has been helpful and enlightening to say the least. I absolutely love diving into bestsellers. I just like seeing how everything works under the hood, right? I just find that stuff so interesting and I hope you do as well. I hope it challenged some of your beliefs. I hope it got you to ask more questions and deeper questions. And if you have any other comments or thoughts that you wanna share, feel free to do that down below. Otherwise, be sure to consider liking and subscribing if you found this video valuable and helpful. By doing that, uh, you're letting others know that yes, this video is in fact valuable and helpful. <laughs> anyway, that's all I got. So I'll see you in the next video. Take care until then, bye.